Part 1. Understanding Your Stress. Chapter 1. Your Brain's Stress Response. Stress is a fact of life, and it's here to stay. Loss, conflict, uncertainty, loneliness, health challenges, competition, deadlines, and financial strain are things we all experience. Your brain's hardwired response to stress, however, is meant to protect you from immediate physical danger. Much of our physiological response to stress was laid down through thousands of years of evolution. A programmed stress response helped our ancestors take fast physical action to keep from being eaten by lions or failing to compete for food. In that sense, it was certainly a good thing. Unfortunately, the same programmed stress response isn't too good at helping us deal with modern-day stresses such as paying the bills, dealing with a grumpy boss or a sick family member, and fighting with our loved ones. These situations don't generally call for physical action, they require understanding people's intentions, dealing with failure, loss, or uncertainty, solving logistical problems, or sustaining mental effort. They require us to process lots of information in a short time, juggle competing priorities, and deal with a rapidly changing world. If you're feeling stressed, it may be because your brain is oversensitive to danger, your brain may be signaling that situations such as those listed above are threats to your survival and readying you for extreme action that isn't necessary or appropriate to your day-to-day -day challenges, Sapolsky 2004. The skills you'll learn in this book will help you calm down your brain's automatic stress reaction, along with excess anxiety and anger, so that the more rational parts of your brain have time to get on board and formulate a more mindful response. With repeated practice of the exercises in this book, your brain will learn to manage stress effectively so that life stressor become manageable challenges rather than insurmountable threats. You may even begin to feel some excitement about mastering the challenges you're faced with in life. But first you have to understand how your brain and body respond to stress. As I say to my client, many of whom are facing major life events or chronic stressor such as loneliness, relationship stress, illness, caretaking, building a business, or unemployment, when you name it, you can tame it. Acute versus chronic stress. As mentioned, your stress response was designed to help you survive immediate threats. When you use a system designed for acute, life-threatening stress over a long period, it can create wear and tear on your mind and body. Acute and chronic stress are different mind-body processes with different effects, Sapolsky 2004. Acute stress is a response to a short-term stressor, such as making a speech, writing an exam, meeting a deadline, or going on a first date. On one hand, this type of stress can create anxiety and psychosomatic symptoms, such as headache and upset stomach. On the other hand, it can make you feel excited and challenged, giving you energy to perform at your best. Mastering an acute stressor can make you feel more confident, skillful, and mature. Chronic stress is a response to a stressor that continues for more than a couple of hours or days. Some jobs, such as those in law enforcement, can be chronically stressful. Deadlines, unhappy relationships, taking care of family members, and not feeling competent at your job can also be stressful. Chronic stress can have negative effects on your mind and body, particularly if you feel helpless to change your circumstances. If you can't see your way out of the situation despite your best efforts, you're likely to become worried or depressed. Chronic stress that isn't managed properly can lead to fatigue, high blood pressure, and weight gain. Luckily, you can learn to manage your stress, whether it's acute or chronic. You can even transform feeling stressed into feeling challenged and energized or feeling grounded and self-confident. Although part of your stress response is hardwired and automatic, you can change the way your brain processes and interprets stress. Repeatedly practicing new ways of thinking and behaving can actually change the neural pathways and chemicals in your brain. Your brain possesses neuroplasticity. Your brain contains billions of neurons, specialized cells that communicate with each other. Over time, any neurons and neural pathways you don't use weaken and wither away, while the ones you use most often become stronger. Your brain also has the ability to grow new neurons from stem cells. This ability to change allows your brain structure and wiring to be molded by experience, a quality known as neuroplasticity. A famous saying, attributed to neuroscientist Donald Hebb, is, neurons that fire together, wire together. When a set of neurons gets activated, they become more closely linked, so that the whole sequence is more likely to repeat in reaction to that type of situation in the future. Your thoughts, 
feelings, and actions can actually change the structure of your brain over time. This explains why your childhood environment can affect your response to stress decades later. It also gives you the potential to change old behaviors that don't help you meet your present-day challenges. You can literally rewire your brain. How Ted changed his automatic response to stress. To illustrate what it means to change an automatic stress response, I'll tell you about my client Ted. Whenever I discuss clients in this book, I've changed names and details to protect confidentiality. Ted was raised by a single mother who lived from paycheck to paycheck. After he graduated from high school, he had to take out student loans and work 30 hours a week to pay for college. He earned a business degree and was recruited by a well-known company, at which, thanks to his conscientiousness and work ethic, he was rapidly promoted. When Ted came to see me for therapy, his company was about to be taken over by a conglomerate, so he was facing the possibility of losing his job or being sidelined. Ted's skills were highly marketable, and he had saved up a lot of money. Yet he was panic-stricken. Ted worried constantly about never getting another job and ending up homeless. He was scared that his wife would leave him, although in reality she was loving and supportive. Ted's brain had been conditioned by his childhood stress to see uncertainty and potential loss as highly stressful. His amygdala labeled his job situation as a huge threat and put his brain and body on high alert. His prefrontal cortex was ineffective at calming down his amygdala. It brought in the information about his past experiences of being abandoned by his father and living in poverty, leading him to feel more fearful. Ted also felt angry at his company's management for not protecting him better. He constantly felt his heart racing and had butterflies in his stomach. He had difficulty thinking clearly. Ted stopped exercising, and his weight and blood pressure increased. He started feeling depressed. In therapy, Ted learned to calm down his amygdala and use his prefrontal cortex more effectively. He learned to see his feelings of fear as part of his automatic stress response and not as an accurate indicator of the actual degree of threat he faced. He learned to tolerate fear and find inner calm by using mindfulness skills similar to those you'll learn in this book. Ted also learned to use his prefrontal cortex to view the situation in ways that could calm down his amygdala. He learned to focus on the fact that he'd survived poverty and was now financially comfortable. He realized his wife loved him dearly and wouldn't leave him, even if he was unemployed. He focused on the skills and competencies, such as a great work ethic, that he already had, as well as on the new skills, such as networking, that he could develop and use to manage the situation. He also learned to take a broader view of his life situation and feel proud of his achievements at work and grateful for his loving wife. This focus led to positive feelings that also calmed down the fear. At the end of therapy, Ted not only was better able to handle his current stress but had tools for managing future stressor. Stress and your emotions. Why did Ted feel so much fear and anger at the prospect of losing his job? And why did he feel depressed after a long period of uncertainty? The emotions of fear and anger are created by your body's physiological stress response, combined with your perception of the situation as a threat. As mentioned, when your amygdala perceives a threat, it executes an automatic program to ready your body to fight or flee. That's because your ancestors faced lions and tigers and had to be able to mount a physical response very quickly. So today, when your amygdala perceives a threat, it initiates fight or flight mode, sending glucose to your brain for quick thinking, making your heart pump faster, and increasing blood flow to the large muscles of your arms and legs to prepare your body for fighting or fleeing. Fear and anger are your subjective experience of your brain's fight or flight response. Fear is a more acute response, often directed at a specific object or situation, such as the prospect of losing your job. Anxiety is similar to fear, but more diffuse and long lasting, such as anxiety about what will happen after you lose your job. In this book, I use the terms anxiety and fear somewhat interchangeably. If a stressor continues for a long time or you face a series of stressor, one after the other, you may start to feel depressed. As a mind-body reaction to a situation that you perceive as uncontrollable and overwhelming, depression is like a freeze response to stress. We'll discuss this in more detail later. In the next section, you'll learn about the structures and processes in your brain that determine your response to stress. Your brain's response to stress.
The parts of your brain that shape your emotional and behavioral response to a stressful situation include your amygdala, hypothalamus, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex. I'll describe each of these brain structures and their functions below. Although we often talk of the amygdala and hippocampus as being single structures, there are actually two parts to each, one half in each hemisphere of your brain. Amygdala, your brain's alarm center. It senses threats and other emotionally significant information and initiates the stress response. Hypothalamus, your brain's operations manager. It coordinates the release of stress hormones to ready your body for fighting or fleeing. Hippocampus, your brain's biographer. It stores and retrieves conscious memories about the current situation as well as previous stressor you've experienced, how you responded, and resulting outcomes. This allows you to learn from past experience and anticipate what's likely to happen. Prefrontal cortex, your brain's CEO. It puts together information from your amygdala and hippocampus to create a planned, motivated response to stress. It communicates back and forth with the amygdala to modify your response as the stressor unfolds. Your amygdala. Your amygdala is a small, about 0.5-inch, almond-shaped structure that acts as your brain's alarm system. It receives sensory information and decides whether an event is emotionally important. If your amygdala senses a threat, it rings a mental alarm bell to tell your hypothalamus to ready your body to respond. Your amygdala does this very rapidly. You may react emotionally to an object or situation before you can even name it. For example, you may jump before your brain can even think of the word snake when you see a snake-shaped object on a hiking trail. In terms of stress, your amygdala can hijack your brain away from what you're doing and into emergency mode when you encounter a stressor. If your amygdala sees the stressful situation as a potential threat to your security, status, or well-being, it puts your brain and body on high alert. Your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is the operations manager of your brain, responsible for initiating and coordinating your hormonal response to stress. When alerted by your amygdala, your hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH. The CRH in turn signals your pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, into your bloodstream, where it causes your adrenal glands to secrete cortisol. Cortisol circulates through your body, readying your muscles and organs for emergency responding. There's a negative feedback loop for restoring your body to balance. When your levels of circulating cortisol get too high, they signal your hypothalamus to stop releasing CRH, which leads to less cortisol being produced and the system returns to a non-stressed state. Your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is a small, seahorse-shaped structure that stores your conscious memories in an organized way. It retrieves memories from the past that may be relevant to your stressor. Your prefrontal cortex accesses these memories so that you can use past experience to inform your response to stress. This means you can avoid trying to cope in ways that didn't work in the past. When you face a very intense or life-threatening stressor, the resultant surge of stress hormones may cause your hippocampus to go offline. This means that the event or situation won't be stored in an organized way in your brain. However, it can still affect your behavior in an unconscious way, through your amygdala, by making you more reactive to other stressful situations. For example, if you were bullied when you were a child, your amygdala may react more strongly to criticism from your boss, even though you're not consciously aware of the connection between those events. Your hippocampus also stores memories about your current response to stress. This means that if you cope successfully, your brain will remember it. This will allow you to feel more confident the next time you encounter that type of event. Your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex is your brain's executive center. It's like the CEO of your brain, directing the whole operation. Your prefrontal cortex evaluates the demands of the current stressful situation and ties it to your past experience so that you can respond effectively. Your prefrontal cortex can be your ally in managing your stress. It allows you to solve complex problems, control your impulses, calm down intense emotions, shift your attention, and adapt to new, uncertain, or changing situations. It's the part of your brain that stops you from losing it when your preschooler is still not dressed despite umpteen reminders and you're stressed about being late for work. Your prefrontal cortex reminds you of how much you love your kid and want to be a good parent and inhibits the impulse to act like a shrew. 
This part of your brain helps you study for exams, refrain from having that extra cookie or drink when you're stressed, or stop watching TV so that you can get your work done. Your prefrontal cortex also connects to your amygdala and hypothalamus to help regulate your emotional response to stress. This part of your brain can help you suppress automatic fearful or angry responses to stressful situations so that you can respond more mindfully and effectively. Your prefrontal cortex is involved in responses such as compassion, shame, and guilt, which modify your amygdala-based reactivity to stress. When you face the stress of public speaking, your prefrontal cortex reminds you of how passionate you feel about the topic that you're speaking about. And when your partner criticizes you, your prefrontal cortex may remind you that your partner is important to you. This calms down your amygdala and eases your stress response so that you can deal more effectively with the stressor. Now that you know about the brain structures involved in responding to stress, the next step is to understand how your brain initiates a physiological stress response to ready your body for fight or flight. Your physiological response to stress. Your stress response consists of a cascade of chemicals that travel rapidly through your body, sending messages to your organs and glands, your large muscles, and even your immune system. In this section, you'll learn how your stress response unfolds, beginning with the release of the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine by your adrenal glands and continuing with the release of cortisol. You'll also learn about how the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of your nervous system regulate your physiological stress response, switching it off when your brain senses the threat is no longer present. Finally, you'll learn how your parasympathetic nervous system produces a freeze response to stressor that you perceive as severe and uncontrollable. Stress in your adrenal glands when your amygdala first notices a stressor, it signals your hypothalamus to initiate a lightning-fast chemical response. Your hypothalamus signals your adrenal glands, situated on top of your kidneys, to release the hormones epinephrine, adrenaline, and norepinephrine into your bloodstream to ready your body for fighting or fleeing. Epinephrine rapidly increases your heart rate and rushes blood to your muscles. It opens airways in your lungs to take in oxygen and send it rapidly to your brain for increased alertness. It also spikes your blood sugar level by increasing the production of glucose in your liver. A surge of glucose provides extra energy to your brain and body. Norepinephrine causes a narrowing of your blood vessels, resulting in higher blood pressure. Do you remember that old ad from the gasoline company Esso, now ExxonMobil, that boasted their fuel put a tiger in your tank, giving your car a fuel injection and performance boost? That ad, which is now in the advertising slogan Hall of Fame, describes your adrenal stress response perfectly. Your tank, meaning your brain and body, gets a supercharged surge of adrenaline and glucose. Your heart beats faster, your brain becomes more alert, and you're ready to go, go, go. Your adrenal gland stress response is a rapid and efficient way of preparing for action in the face of an immediate threat. However, if it goes on for a long time, it can be toxic to your body. Continuous surges of epinephrine can make you vulnerable to high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and heart attack. Luckily, this book will give you tools for managing stress to help keep those things from happening. Next, let's look at the role of cortisol in your stress response. Stress and cortisol. If a stressor persists for more than a few minutes, your hypothalamus signals your pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. ACTH signals your adrenal glands to release cortisol. Cortisol elevates your blood sugar and stimulates your liver to produce glucose, which is used by your brain to support attention and alertness. It prepares your organs to withstand stress, pain, or injury. Cortisol also suppresses non-emergency functions related to digestion, reproduction, growth, and resistance to disease. If cortisol sticks around for too long, the resultant immune system suppression makes you more vulnerable to infection. This is why you're more likely to get sick if you're chronically stressed. As your circulating cortisol levels rise, they send a signal to your body to stop producing more cortisol, so the process is self-regulating. However, chronic stress, trauma, or a series of acute stressor can disrupt this process. Imbalance in levels of cortisol and other stress hormones can cause physiological wear and tear, known as allostatic load, McEwen 1998. Too much allostatic load increases your risk for heart disease, diabetes, obesity, colds and flu, depression, and anxiety. In some situations, your body may produce less cortisol in response to stress. 
This can happen in chronic fatigue syndrome. Living a healthy lifestyle and practicing the coping strategies in this book can help you better manage your stresses, whether they're acute or chronic. Stress and your autonomic nervous system. Once initiated by your amygdala, your stress response is distributed throughout your body by your autonomic nervous system, ANS, which consists of nerve cells in your brain and spinal cord. Your ANS has two branches, your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system, SNS, acts as your ANS's accelerator. It communicates with your adrenal glands to stimulate the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which put your whole body on high alert and ready for action. When the danger is over, your parasympathetic nervous system, PNS, acts as a break, calming down your system and facilitating a return to a resting state and continuation of non-emergency functions such as sleepiness, appetite, and sex drive the fun stuff. The interplay between these two branches of your ANS supports a balance between at rest and emergency functions, known as homeostasis. However, if stress is excessive or too prolonged, your ANS can become inflexible, your PNS is unable to put the brakes on anxious arousal. If this happens, your brain and body remain on constant high alert. When your ANS is working well, it's as if you're cruising merrily down the highway, slowing when you need to stopping at traffic lights, and then moving forward smoothly into the flow of traffic. When the system gets overused and stops working correctly, it's as if you're hurtling through life with faulty brakes, going way too fast, and wearing your engine out. So far, we've discussed the fight or flight component of your acute stress response. This involves the activation of your SNS and its interaction with your PNS. In the next section, you'll learn about the freeze component of your stress response, which is initiated by your PNS in response to severe, uncontrollable stress. Stress and your vagus nerve. Your brain and body are wired to respond to stress with activation and action. But what if, fight or flight, doesn't work? In the case of an airplane crash, a natural disaster, or some other unavoidable threat, continuing to try to fight or run away from the stressor may not only tax your body but increase your suffering. If you can't get away or defend yourself, the only thing left to do is try to numb yourself to the inevitable pain. And your body has a mechanism to do just that, a primitive, parasympathetic, freeze, response that's carried through your body by your vagus nerve. The, freeze, response isn't unique to humans, it occurs in many animal species. Think of the, deer in the headlights, effect. To illustrate the response of your vagus nerve to severe, overwhelming stress, Imagine there's a car hurtling toward you and you don't have time to jump out of the way. After the initial moment of shock, your body's only defense is to shut down and immobilize itself. This response consists of rapid decreases in heart rate and interruptions in breathing that desensitize you to the pain of inescapable danger. You may feel faint, dizzy, or spaced out. If the situation is extreme, you may even lose consciousness. I experienced a freeze. Response one time when I was in graduate school. I had slept over at my girlfriend's house so that we could study for an exam together. On the morning of the exam, feeling smug and well prepared, we were driving to school when another car ran a red light and hit us on my side of the car. I must have passed out, because all I remember is a flash of light and then my friend standing next to me calling my name. When I looked around, the door next to me was hanging by a thread. I had to go to the hospital to get checked out and didn't make my exam, but I was otherwise unhurt. My vagus nerve had protected me from the terror of the situation by shutting my brain and body down. Interestingly, I may pay a price for that today, because I sometimes start when traffic slows down suddenly and my husband doesn't begin to brake, or maybe I'm just a backseat driver. You may also experience a freeze response in relation to normal stressor that aren't life-threatening. For example, some people faint or get dizzy at the sight of blood. If you were abandoned, abused, or neglected as a child, you may feel frozen or immobilized when faced with rejection, loneliness, job loss, or serious financial stress. That's because your brain didn't learn to be resilient. You, as an adult, have to teach it how. Past experiences of uncontrollability and failure can make you feel overwhelmed, unconfident, and scared to act. The practices in this book will help you train your brain and body to overcome this sense of helplessness so that you can act more effectively to cope with stress. In the next section, you'll learn how stress affects your brain.
stress and neurotransmitters. Neurons in your brain communicate with each other by sending and receiving chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters involved in responding to stress include dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and gamma-aminobutyric acid, GABA. Stress increases levels of dopamine in your prefrontal cortex. Dopamine is associated with motivation and reward-seeking, and it plays a role in addiction and aggression. Increased dopamine in your prefrontal cortex can have a motivating effect, helping you perform your best. But if you're too stressed out, Excess dopamine can make you act more impulsively, without thinking things through. Stress also leads to an increase in dopamine and norepinephrine in your amygdala, showing that your amygdala is activated by stress and ready to hijack your brain into emergency mode. Your hippocampus, or memory center, also gets activated by stress, as shown by increased levels of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and GABA. Your response to stress is affected by past exposure. Memories stored in your hippocampus add a layer of motivation or emotion to the stressful situation. Remember that your prefrontal cortex integrates information from your hippocampus about your ability to handle this type of situation and communicates with your amygdala to calm down your stress response. Thinking about how well you've coped with similar stressor in the past can help you feel more calm and grounded. I often encourage my clients to think of stressful situations they've survived or mastered so that they can apply the same skills to their current stressor. On the other hand, memories of past negative outcomes of stressor or of feeling helpless can increase the stress of the current situation. Your amygdala and hippocampus can communicate with each other directly, without going through your prefrontal cortex. This can create a positive feedback loop that increases your overall stress level and makes it more difficult for your prefrontal cortex to calm things down. Your stress response plays out in your brain and body through neurotransmitters and hormones that affect both your body's reactions and your emotional response to the situation. In the next section, you'll learn about the long-term effects of chronic stress on your mind and body. Learning about the effects of chronic stress may help motivate you to manage your stress before it becomes harmful to your health. The effects of chronic stress. Over time, stress can affect your brain, your heart, your weight, your resistance to disease, and even your genetic makeup. Ongoing worry and anxiety can exacerbate your stress and not give your body a chance to rest and recover. Stress and your brain. Prolonged or excessive stress interferes with brain function in a few different ways. Stress impairs your brain cells' ability to transport and use glucose, an important source of energy. Without enough glucose, your brain cells are less resilient and more vulnerable to damage. Your hippocampus is particularly vulnerable to the damaging effects of cortisol. Excess cortisol affects your hippocampus's ability to produce new brain cells and repair existing cells. This can negatively affect your ability to learn, your memory, and your mood. Chronic stress and excess cortisol may strengthen connections between your amygdala and hippocampus in a way that predisposes you to a chronic state of emergency preparedness. At the same time, it can weaken the connectivity between these areas and your prefrontal cortex, leading to less regulation of your stress response by the rational parts of your brain. In other words, too much stress can lead your brain to automatically become more reactive, with less ability to calm down your stress response through logical thinking. That's why strategies in this book such as mindfulness, which increases the connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and amygdala, are particularly effective in calming down stress in your brain. Stress and your heart. When your heart experiences repeated surges of epinephrine, due to chronic stress, the lining of your blood vessels can become damaged, raising your risk of hypertension, stroke, and heart attack. Stress can also lead you to engage in unhealthy behaviors that increase your risk of heart disease, you may overindulge in alcohol, smoke, or eat excessively. You may also become hostile and angry. If this describes you, it's time to take a few deep breaths to put the brakes on your fight, flight, or freeze response so that your prefrontal cortex has time to calm things down. Stress and weight gain. Cortisol increases your appetite because food gives you energy for the upcoming battle. Cortisol also interferes with sleep and you eat more unhealthy foods when you're tired. Over long periods, chronic stress can increase your blood sugar and causes your body to hang on to excess fat, especially belly fat. Although this effect of stress may have helped our ancestors protect their organs from injury in battle, Epileal, 2000, it's bad for your health. In fact, 
The apple-shaped body with a high waist-to-hip ratio is a risk factor for heart disease, regardless of your weight. So, if you're one of those people who can't stop emotional eating or who can't seem to break through a weight plateau even when you reduce your calorie intake, chronic stress could be the reason why. In that case, the stress-reducing strategies in this book may help you naturally lose belly fat without dieting. Stress and your immune system. The first studies of stress in the immune system, in the early 1990s, focused on medical students taking exams. It was found that, during exam periods as brief as three days, students experienced a decrease in immune cells that fight tumors and viral infections, Glazer et al., 1993. Hundreds of subsequent studies in the field of psychoneuroimmunology found clear patterns, stressing people for a few minutes in the laboratory, by way of having them engage in public speaking or mental arithmetic, resulted in an increase in one type of immunity mixed with other signs of immune weakening. However, chronic stress lasting from a few days to months or years seemed to weaken the immune system, Glazer and Keokult Glazer 2005. Researchers at Carnegie Mellon University measured subjects' levels of stress and then isolated them in hotel rooms to minimize outside influences and expose them to the common cold. Those who were under more stress were more likely to catch colds, Cohen, Tyrrell, and Smith 1991. When your immune system faces a harmful virus or bacterium, pathogen, it releases chemicals called inflammatory cytokines to fight off the attacker. This response, known as inflammation, is a normal process that keeps you healthy. Under non-stressful conditions, after the pathogen has been defeated, a feedback loop involving cortisol, mentioned earlier, reduces the inflammatory response, too much stress seems to make your immune system insensitive to the signaling function of cortisol. This may make you more vulnerable to allergies and asthma or to inflammatory diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. Stress and cellular aging. In a study of the effects of chronic stress on cellular aging, researchers at the University of California looked at mothers who were taking care of kids with autism and chronic diseases. The researchers measured telomeres, a part of your DNA, your genetic material, that controls cellular aging. One way to picture telomeres is to think of a chromosome, a strand of genes, as a shoelace. The telomere is the plastic tip that protects the DNA from damage. Telomeres naturally thin as they age, making DNA vulnerable to fraying. It turns out that telomeres are highly sensitive to chronic stress. The moms who reported being more stressed had much shorter telomeres, equivalent to at least 10 years of extra aging, Epil et al. 2004. However, moms who didn't perceive their lives as highly stressful, even though they had a child with a chronic disability, didn't exhibit the telomere shortening effect. In other words, how you view your stress matters. If you can find a way to lighten your load psychologically, your brain and body will be more resistant to stress, and your stressor won't get under your skin as much. This book will provide you with an array of psychological tools for managing your stress, as you'll see in the following chapters. But first, let's take a look at how stressed you're feeling. How stressed do you feel? Let's take a moment to assess your perceived stress, or how stressed you feel, regardless of the reason why. When it comes to predicting how stress will affect your long-term health, your feelings of being stressed and out of control are just as important as the actual stressor you face. This is good news, because you can't always choose what you have to deal with in life, but you can change how you feel and think about stress. Practice. Measuring your level of stress. For each item, circle the number that best represents your answer, where 0 equals never, 1 equals occasionally or almost never, 2 equals sometimes, 3 equals fairly often, and 4 equals very often. In the past month, how often have you been upset because of an unexpected event or frustration? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Believe that you couldn't control important life outcomes? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Felt, on edge, and stressed out? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Believe that things weren't going your way? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Believe that you had more to handle than you could deal with? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Felt irritable and impatient about small things? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Felt your heart racing or butterflies in your stomach? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 
been unable to sleep because of your worries? Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Felt anxious when you woke up in the morning? Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Had difficulty concentrating because of your problems? Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. If you circled at least two, two S, three S, or four S, you're probably feeling at least moderately stressed. If you circled many threes or four S, you're probably under high stress and aren't managing it well on your own. You may want to consult a mental health professional in addition to using the tools in this book. Final thoughts. In this chapter, you learn the difference between acute and chronic stress, how your brain processes stress, and how your hypothalamus, your autonomic nervous system, and your vagus nerve control your body's stress response. You learned how communication between your amygdala, your hippocampus, and your prefrontal cortex can modify your stress response. You also learned about some of the damaging effects of chronic stress and elevated cortisol levels. In the next chapter, you'll learn more about the different types of stressor in life, so that you'll be better able to cope with your specific situation.